This is a gaming laptop that's hard to believe exists. It's compact, good looking, and has a reasonable fan noise with incredible gaming performance that rivals desktop 3090 Ti graphic cards. But considering its competition, is this worth its eye-watering price of 4,300 US dollars? So let's take a look at the thermals, gaming benchmarks, and more, then a quick comparison to a laptop nearly half its price to find out. The configuration I have here is a 13th gen Intel i9-13950HX and RTX 4090 with 32 gigs of DDR5 RAM and two terabytes of storage. It still has the same look as previous years with an aluminum unibody and a black finish with an illuminated green Razer logo on the lid. It can attract fingerprints, but I've noticed that this year's picks up a lot less smudges, at least for me. I have been using it every day for the past two weeks, and I haven't really felt the need to wipe it down often. Your mileage may vary there. I wish Razer offered a mercury white version. They tend to offer a white variant of their laptops after initial release. It would be nice to give that color option on release. Like all of Razer's laptops, the build quality is absolutely solid. Basically no flex on the lid and keyboard deck. The footprint is nearly identical to a six 16 inch MacBook Pro. Of course, a bit thicker to make room for all of that cooling. Still, you should have no problems fitting this into most standard size backpacks. On the left, we have a power connector, two USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports, a USB C 3.2 Gen 2 with power delivery up to 100 watts, and a headphone microphone jack. On the right is an HDMI 2.1 port one USB 3.2 Gen 2 port, Thunderbolt 4 with power delivery up to 100 watts, and an SD card reader. It would be cool to see them add an Ethernet port on the 16 inch. They have it on the Blade 18, and Alienware was able to manage an Ethernet port on their M16, so in the meantime, you'll need a USB to Ethernet adapter if you plan to have a wired internet connection. Opening the lid, you're presented with a 16 inch dual mode mini LED display. So this year, it's got a taller 16 by 10 aspect ratio, and it can natively switch between full HD plus at 240 Hertz or UHD plus at 120 Hertz. So if you don't know what mini LED is, the short version is it's a more effective way to backlight the screen. It uses smaller LED diodes in the backlight for more precise control, allowing for less backlight bleed and stronger contrasts. When done well, it can look nearly as good as an OLED display, but typically brighter and without any worry of burn-in. And I've gotta say, this is easily the best looking display I've ever seen on a gaming laptop. The blacks are completely black. I have not noticed any blooming and the highlights in some scenes are incredibly bright. That mixed with the 4K resolution at 120 Hertz and games look absolutely incredible on it. I honestly wasn't expecting to be this impressed with the display, but I really am. My Spider X Elite is measuring the color accuracy at 100% of the sRGB, 93% of the Adobe RGB and 100% of the P3 color gamut. And the brightness gets to 746 nits, which is pretty bright. You shouldn't have a problem seeing the screen in most conditions. With the dual mode, you also have that option to switch between that native Full HD Plus at 240 Hertz and UHD Plus at 120 Hertz. This can be pretty useful if you plan to play more competitive shooters or just want that higher refresh rate. You can select the option in Synapse, then restart for the updated option to go into effect. I personally keep it at UHD Plus for the majority of the time, but it's nice that the option is there when you need it. The last thing I'll say about the screen is that even though the dual mode functionality is cool, I think I would still have preferred just a mini LED quad HD plus screen at 240 Hertz. That to me feels like it would be the best of both worlds, especially on a laptop this size. They do offer a quad HD version, but it's just not mini LED. Above the display is a 1080p webcam and Windows Hello. The webcam's not great, it's passable in a pinch, but really nothing special. The Blade 18 has a 1440p 5 megapixel webcam that looks significantly better, but the 16 inch here has a physical privacy shutter with a red dot indicating when it's closed. I do like having that physical switch for privacy. It's just weird they didn't put it on the 18. Okay, so moving down to the keyboard, it's your typical Blade keyboard. You have the RGB backlighting that is fully customizable in Razer Synapse. I think Razer does this the best. The power button is located on the top right, which may be prone to an accidental press if you're aiming for the backspace key. A quick press won't turn off the computer. You have to hold it down for a few seconds, but it's still something you might wanna watch out for. And there are no dedicated macro keys, but you can set up Razer HyperShift for customizable functions if you need it. I do like the overall typing experience. The keys themselves feel high quality and they're nice to type on. It does take me some time to adjust to the layout. The keys feel like they're slightly closer together than what I'm used to on my MacBook and Logitech keyboard. So I do find myself overreaching and accidentally pressing the wrong key. I think most people will adjust quickly and enjoy this keyboard overall. Beneath that is a very large 7.5 inch glass trackpad. I found it to be accurate 
it uses Microsoft Precision drivers and has a very smooth texture. I have had problems with palm rejection, especially in game. A lot of misfires when my palm would touch the touchpad. I didn't have the same issue on the 18 inch, probably because there's more room for the palm rests. Either way, I just went to the window settings and turned off the touchpad when a mouse is connected. And that workaround has been fine for me. The speakers sit on either side of the keyboard deck and they sound fine. They get loud, but lose clarity, I'd say above 70% volume. Okay, flipping over the device, the bottom cover is easy enough to open. There are eight T5 screws. Then you can pull the cover toward the front of the laptop to unlatch and then remove. You can see the top two fans in the vapor chamber cooler, and there are two M.2 slots, each with one terabyte of storage. They are user replaceable up to four terabytes. And the RAM is also upgradable up to 64 gigs. Okay, so gaming benchmarks. All benchmarks here are with the latest Windows and NVIDIA drivers, with the GPU set to high and the CPU set to boost in Razer Synapse. No overclocking or undervolting, but I did switch to the dedicated GPU only mode in the NVIDIA control panel for these tests. Rasterization performance is quite good across these more demanding games, all of which can easily get over 60 frames or higher in 4k if you enable dlss and the games that support it what i am testing here are more demanding scenarios at max out settings and with the new frame generation feature introduced in the 4000 series graphic cards this effectively doubles the frame rates in the few titles that do support it when gaming and running benchmarks the gpu was pulling around 160 watts and the cpu over 60 watts i noticed the gpu pulling the full 175 watts when testing ray tracing titles at 4k and averaging around 78 degrees celsius during the heaven benchmark. In Time Spy, I'm getting a score at nearly 20,000, which is on par with many desktop 3090 GPUs. And I suspect you could get even higher if you're willing to overclock. One thing I would be mindful of in the Blade 16 is the 13950HX. If you're going to be putting it under full load for stuff like rendering or encoding, the 24 cores in total and the potential to pull upwards of 130 watts, it can get pretty hot. In a 10 minute multi-core stress test in Cinebench 23, the 13950HX in the Blade 16 is scoring over 24,000, but it's topping out at 100 degrees Celsius with core temperatures averaging 92 degrees Celsius. Now this is a worst case scenario for the CPU and the average CPU package temp I'm seeing when gaming is more in the high 80s. The area above the keyboard gets very hot at around 52 degrees Celsius, but the WSD key stayed at a much more comfortable temperature at 31 degrees Celsius. You can actually feel the fan directly under these keys blowing that cool air which is really helping keep the temperatures down in that area. The palm rests also get warmer than I would like. It's just warmer at 36 degrees Celsius. I can imagine many people will get sweaty hands during a longer play session. So using the custom profile with the CPU set to boost and the GPU set to high, the fan noise is sitting around 59 decibels. I would say this is loud enough to where you would likely want to wear headphones, at least I do. And in balanced mode, it's at a much less distracting 51 decibels. Silent mode is around 45. So in that silent mode, the fans are barely audible and I don't believe it would distract anybody else in the room. Okay, for battery life, doing light tasks, such as streaming video and browsing the internet with no updates or downloads running in the background, at 4K, 60 hertz, in battery saver mode, I got five and a half hours of battery life. The 330 watt power adapter is quite compact and it has a nice braided cable but I found it to be cumbersome to put away. It also adds around two pounds to the total package. The configuration I have here is quite expensive at 4,300 US dollars, but whether that's worth it or not is very subjective. I've also been testing the Alienware M16 with an i9-13900HX and a 4080, a laptop that is $1,700 cheaper than the Blade 16 I have configured here. The Blade 16 definitely scores higher, but in 1440p gameplay, the Alienware is actually performing as good or better in the few titles I've tested out of the box. The Blade is only really outperforming it in 4K. There are other differences as well, of course. The Alienware doesn't have that dual mode mini LED display, the premium build quality, and it has a larger footprint with a huge power brick. For $1,700 less, the Alienware is looking a bit more appealing in my opinion. Now, of course, there are other 4090 laptops that are less expensive than the Blade and even more between these two prices. But it's just as a point of comparison that you can get most of what the Blade offers for significantly less money. But most people know that you don't buy a new Razer Blade because of its value. You buy it because of those premium features. Nonetheless, the complete package is really impressive. And it's pretty insane to have desktop 3090 performance in a laptop at this size. And that level of performance is definitely more than enough for most people. So while it's on the pricey side, this laptop is still incredible. Before you go, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to hit the like button. And if you wanna see more, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. You can click the thumbnail right here on the screen. Thanks for watching.